Two things we're going to be covering in this. Two, just two. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not. The guidelines that Michelle mentioned earlier on, and then a quick look at the E-mode system. Now, there are lots of uh, guidelines and E-mode type systems out there. But this particular one is really, really recent. It was only produced about three months ago. And uh, myself and about uh, 14, 15 other people pulled it together. And what we did was we were surveying the literature to find out what kind of information is out there that's useful or otherwise for professionals to use, particularly such as inspectors and other people who need to go and look at facilities and assess them. And so we used criteria to try and reduce the information that was out there and we insisted on including only objective, impartial, evidence-based information. And we came up with about 100 and something, 120 something different published items from which we could pull the best bits. It's surprising how many different pieces of guidance have really good information in them and then some really not very good information. And that obviously compromises your work and everybody else's when you sit down to try and rely on one document and there are bits in it that frankly you're not comfortable with or that don't work. So what we tried to do is to pull all the good bits that do work into one document and then wheedle out the stuff that's not really helpful. And that produced the uh, guidance I was talking about. And once this guidance was published just three, three months ago, it was immediately the subject of great interest around the world and in many other publications reporting on it. And that's because there's been such a strong need for this kind of information out there. Now, it was published in a journal called Frontiers in Veterinary Science. There are thousands of science journals available. But Frontiers in Veterinary Science is one of the world's top 20 journals. So we were really fortunate that they were interested in this particular work. It's a peer-reviewed journal, which means it's a high-level journal. And it's published all over the world. And this gives you a, a, a quick idea of the numbers and locations of downloads and views of this particular article, just within three months, remember. So what it shows is that a lot of people, obviously a lot in the UK, but spread out very broadly, a lot of people immediately flocked to this piece of guidance and said, we need this kind of information. I hope they're going to be very happy with it. Now, I have been berating Canadians all week. <laughs> I, I have. But I owe Canada an apology. Yes, because it seems Canada isn't on the technical grid. So they don't get to report their downloads. But what's more concerning is why is Canada not on the grid when South Korea and China and New Zealand are? <laughs> what kind of show are you running here? Right? Either way, there are some Canadians who have looked at it, but you'll just never know who they were or where. Now, it's split up into a whole variety of uh, subjects, many subjects. I cannot go through them all because they're just too many. But initially, it starts with what you might describe as housekeeping issues, the layout that, that a shop or facility should be. And remember, or well, bear in mind that this is supposed to cover pet shops, wholesalers, boarding kennels, rescue centers, uh, all these kinds of facilities where animals are kept. And so hygiene, staff protocols, the, the disease management and so on within a particular establishment all should be part of uh, any good management system and th we cover those. I, I don't go through them here because you will find them tedious, of course, uh, and some, I think, are more important than others, so I've quickly highlighted those I think we can quickly have a look at. It's only a 20-page published document. All you need to do, I mean, you will be sent the links to it anyway, but literally all you need to do, like every other resource I'm referring to here, uh, you can get them free online. You just go to it, click download, and it's yours. So these are the issues we're going to be having a quick look at, mostly the biological type of things. But one of the key things about the housekeeping issue, as I see it, is fire safety. 
I mean, it's one thing if somebody trips over a mop, but it's a totally different thing if somebody happens to burn the whole place down with the animals in it. So one of the conditions that we have in here is that all animals must be removable from the establishment in a time frame set by the experts, experts being fire safety officers. It's no point us saying what that time frame should be because one shop or one facility may be evacuated far more quickly or slowly than another. That's something that the experts need to determine, but they have to prove it. So when you go into a facility, you say, don't just tell me you can get these out in 20 minutes, show me. Now, this is quite a, uh, an important thing here because, it's, as I said, cluttering is an issue, but if you have tanks full of fish, well, I don't know whether you, you've ever tried to lift a full tank full of water, it is heavy, even if it were to survive the, the lifting process, which it may not. So this requires a paradigm shift in the way that animals are actually housed because the alternative is what? You're just going to leave animals there on the basis that they're going to boil to death or the glass is going to crack and the animals are going to spill out all over the floor. Is that something that should be acceptable? Why is a fish less important than a kitten? Shouldn't be. So if they can't evacuate all the animals in say 20 minutes or whatever is the given time, you fail them. Now, one of the key things about the way we compiled this evidence is that uh, this uh, document is that all the evidence that went into it and all the information that hopefully people pass on from facilities has to be independent, objective and evidence-based. There's no use relying on the pet trade or even hobbyist groups to impart impartial information. They have a vested interest. They're either passionately involved with it or they make money out of it. Ask a Mercedes salesman whether you should buy a Mercedes or a Ford, what do you think they'll say? So don't allow information, if you can control it, to be given out by vested interests. Don't allow them any part in it. Space is one of the fundamental things, it's so important. Space isn't just about giving animals room to exercise, move to uh, exhibit normal or normal-ish behaviors, it's also about the facilities that go into that environment. There's more than just the animal in there. It's the furnishings, water bowls, there's the temperature gradient that it must accommodate. You can't accommodate a decent temperature gradient in a very, very small environment. You have to have a certain amount of air. So space is really, really important. And one of the key things, one of the problematic things about space the world over is that most recommendations for space are made up on a whim, made up because somebody just thinks that's about right. Because it's worked for them doesn't mean it'll work for somebody else. It just doesn't. And because of that, you get all sorts of, of hit and miss guidance. Now, Adrian was telling you earlier on about the size of a tank that a, a snake could be put in. Well, he's absolutely right. This is the bog standard advice, but it's not based on evidence or science. It's based on folklore husbandry, on nonsense. And that's something that needs to be gotten rid of, and I'll return to that a bit later. So what we did is we picked the best advice, the best guidance that was out there, found all the kind of cage sizes that appear to be working, and then reverse engineered the maths, the geometry, to come up with a simple kind of algorithm. And it works roughly this way, and I'll show you a picture in a minute to, to emphasize it. If you take any animal, any animal, it can be a tarantula, a tortoise, a snake, a bird, and you imagine it in a coiled or ball-like state, so you're sort of getting the animal's overall bulk size, draw an imaginary line across it, and then times that line by 10. That should give you the minimum acceptable spatial dimension for that animal. And if it's an arboreal species, you then increase it vertically as well, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. And to stop people keeping animals in these little micro environments where you have a tiny little fish or a tiny little frog that's one centimeter long, and they say, fine, we'll keep it in a 10 centimeter long container. To stop that, you have an absolute minimum size of 100 centimeters. And then the third thing you usually consider with space 
is overcrowding, or stocking density, before it gets overcrowded. And for this, we have a very simple principle, which is a crypto overcrowding principle Michel told you about earlier on. It's really simple. All animals must be able to use all facilities. And that means that if there's a water bowl and 10 animals, but only four can get round it, that's overcrowded. Even if the space is considerable, if they cannot use all the facilities, or any facility, at any one time, the whole lot of the animals, then it's overcrowded. It's a very simple principle. And these three principles allow you to determine space. Some species will want an outside exercise area or a play area, <coughs> puppies and so on, some birds. And so what it looks like is this. Uh, this isn't a glass tank. Don't think I'm saying this is glass. This is a good idea. It's all too often the case. You will go in and you will find animals in very, very small enclosures. With this, for instance, all these animals are calculated to have a 15 centimeter when they're rolled up 15 centimetre diameter. So the tortoise is already 15 centimetres. You simply take a look at that animal. Essentially, the tortoise has done your job for you. It's already made itself a ball, so you don't have to do that. <laughs> you take a look at the tortoise and you say, right, there you are. That tortoise is always 15 centimetres across. Ten times that's 1.5 metres. There we go. Anything less than that, unacceptable. You take the lizard, Imagine a lizard coil, draw, draw a line across it. Again, in, in this diagram, they're all calculated to be 15 centimetres across for consistency of the messaging. Again, that's the minimum size for the lizard. Not, let's go three times the length of the snout to tail, which would give a lizard about this much space here. It can barely turn around in it. It's ridiculous. That's what a lot of the common guidance says. It's a load of nonsense. A load of nonsense. Same thing for the kitten, and of course, coming back to this rule with the snake, if you take any snake's body, do that thing across it, you'll find it'll, it'll come out so that it can stretch out in this environment. Same thing with the fish. Ball pythons. These are all wild-caught ball pythons. Returns to the first presentation I gave, if you remember that. People say ball pythons, they're all captured bed. No, they're not. These are all wild-caught, these. And so that's obviously overcrowded. You don't need me to tell you that. That's so obviously overcrowded. Nice and simple, that one. And then all those dead ball pythons I showed you earlier on that had been in the freezer and now they're like in little convenient blocks. Well, they're from here. These are the dead ones that were pulled out from underneath this. Again, obviously overcrowded or not? Yes. Clearly overcrowded. No question about it. Easy judgment to make. Well, same thing. Same thing. Ah, it gets a bit sticky now, doesn't it? Because we have space and they're climbing on it. But what you don't realize is there's just one heat lamp under here. It cannot heat the whole area. And they can't all get on the floating log if they want to. And because they can't use all of the facilities together, it's crypto overcrowded. It's a fail. It's overcrowded. <coughs> And again, there are actually four ball pythons in here. One nose, two, three, and four. Now, you can make a case to some extent that they've been squeezed in, shoehorned in, but that's really not good enough. So this is also overcrowded. It's, it's, it's not a comfortable environment, and they're uh, struggling to use the one <coughs> facility. This is something that should be a must. I referred to it in the first presentation. It should be a must. All snakes should be able to straighten out. So if you see this kind of environment, you could say, right, it's just about meeting the, the minimum standard. So a lot of people, they would say, well, that's a really good facility. Well, it's minimum standard. Reptile show. Fail. Very obvious. Fail. Reptile show, fail. What else is going on here? I'll tell you. It's a very shiny little, almost ice cream, Tupperware tub kind of plastic thing. They put these chips in. These chips are dry. They slide from one end to the other. The lizard takes a few movements. And suddenly, the substrate that it's supposed to be able to sit on, absorb waste products, get some kind of comfort from, 
may actually eat and then die as well, but never mind that for now. They're all down one side, and the lizard's now sitting on bare plastic. Nothing like this should be out there. Nothing like this should be out there. But it's common. It's common in the hobby groups and the, the reptile shows. If you see it, fail them. Same story as for the lizard. These tortoises are all trying to venture one way, and in scrabbling their way that way, they've pushed all the substrate this way. I'm not condoning the space here. I think you can see that's a fail. It's not 10 times the size of the animal, is it? And you'll hear from people who run the reptile shows, they'll say, well, it's temporary, temporary. How many hours do you think those animals have been in transit, going from one facility to another? If it's a two-day event, where do you think they, they're taken from there to the equivalent of the Sheraton overnight? No. They stay in those boxes or something like them. Not acceptable. I think this is PetSmart, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but I think it's PetSmart. And look at the sizes of these environments. People take a look at these environments and they say, ah, if they're all right like that in the pet shop, then they've got to be like that in my home. Pet shops should be exemplary. They should be showing people, look, this is how it should be. Not that that's going to be great, but this is minimum good, safe standard. Not this. I must say, though, in this case, this is Lynn Michaud from the OSPCA. Anybody from the OSPCA here will know Lynn Michaud. And her hand is about this big, like that. It's enormous. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so that's actually a very big cage there. It's just, I didn't want to mention it. Now, Adrian showed you some much better pictures of the racking system than I had. But I suspect he was either in there and got the pictures or he stole them. You stole them. Yeah. Yeah. So my legally acquired pictures <laughs> are not very good, but uh, they demonstrate that this is kind of the norm for so many people. A lot of reptile keepers would be disgusted with that. And one of the interesting things that's been coming up in the last few months in some debates that have been going around is, well, of course, we keep all our snakes in enclosures that allow the animal to fully stretch, even snakes. You don't have just one kind of reptile collector who is all bad. You have a lot of reptile collectors who say, we're not happy with that kind of standard, and we don't accept it. But they then tend to be muted by the more vociferous uh, crowd. But one of the typical arguments for these reptile people, as I said earlier on in the folklore section, was that They'll say, oh, the, these animals are happy in here, really? Well, open the doors, open the cages, and see where these animals are in the morning. You'll be looking around for them. If they were that comfortable in there, you would not need a front to them. They'll be gone. Hardly surprising when you see what's inside. Virtually nothing. This is the, an example of what, years ago, I termed the phrase a life support system. You simply put <coughs> stuff in and it keeps the animal alive, but it's not a life of quality. And so again, you'd fail this. It gets a bit messy here because obviously a lot of numbers, so I won't dwell on these, but I just wanted to explain the principle of how we manage to pull together guidance that has a one-size-fits-all policy. Because if you try to look at individual species, and we have something like 13,000 plus exotic pet species in circulation. You cannot develop dedicated guidance for all those animals. Certainly, there isn't the budget for it, and we probably don't even have the evidence out there for it. So what we're doing here is we're taking the habitats from which these animals come, the climates. There is, fortunately, a mass of data on the world climate zones and the habitat types that are out there. And then we top and tail the extremes. Because in nature, you do get extremes of temperature and humidity and so on, and you don't want that to be imposed on animals. They have particular adaptive mechanisms to deal with it. Some of them even get caught out, but at least they are accustomed and evolved to deal with it, and they try to make the best of their environments and usually succeed. We can't account for all of that in nature, so we developed safety net zones. Safety net zones, and that's to say that rather than have to know the species, if you know the region from which it comes, or the habitat type from which it comes, which would then include many more species, 
in one go, you can actually provide essential criteria of temperature, humidity, and so on. And especially for people who are running rescue centers, etc., where they're dealing with a lot of animals, this provides safe, a safe environment, like a safe house. You're not talking about brilliant husbandry, world-breaking husbandry, safe zones. This is a bit out of place, this slide, but uh, I wanted to introduce it for the simple fact that often with an environment, you can have a very large environment, uh, but a very small heated basking area. And in the case of these lizards, no matter how big the, other the rest of the environment is, they flock to this one little zone because it's the only area that they feel comfortable and suitable and it's useful for their uh, thermoregulation. So I said that slide was out of place, so we're we back to this lot. So when it comes to, again, uh, lighting a periodicity, you can go by the open, closed habitat types. It doesn't cover everything, but it gives you a, a, a safety zone in which you can at least work to keep animals. It gives you an approximation of the split between day and night and so on, number of hours. Uh, again, UV lighting is something that only in the last few years there's been some, some pretty decent work done on the needs of many reptiles, but again, not all. But if you go by the world zones from which they live, you can at least get, a, again, a ballpark idea of the kind of UV exposure that is in their world. It doesn't mean you can plonk them in those levels of UV 24-7, because animals shuttle between light and dark, and open and closed habitat. But it gives you a ballpark figure to, or figures to work with depending on the habitat type. And again, with sound and noise, and this is important, a lot of animals are very sensitive to sound, noise, disturbance. So you need to know roughly the range of sound, the, the uh, hertz, the cycles per second of sound that they can hear and take that into account. And so what we've done is split out the, the general range of animals and listed essentially ballpark-wise what they can hear, so you know that if there's a fan right next to the birds, that could be disturbing them. And again, uh, substrate, lots of different types of substrate. You'll see lots of artificial substrates. Sometimes they're workable. A lot of the time, they're a health, a health hazard for the animals. And even substrates that are good, in captive <coughs> situations, they can go bad because animals get understimulated and they will develop a condition called pica, where they will actually eat parts of the substrate and other, other items of furnishing, cause impactions in their gut, uh, and, and get very sick or die. And that's just one of, <coughs> one of the issues. Sometimes they simply pick the substrate up with the food and ingest it and causes a problem that way. So substrate's really important, and getting uh, the most naturalistic and safe substrates are, are, are really important. So we, we listed them here, again, according to the type of animal, not the species gives you more to work with. And something that's so important to anybody inspecting a facility, but it's also important to the people running the facility, is to be able to recognize essential signs of welfare. You're not making veterinary diagnoses, that's for the vets to do. But you're recognizing indicators of good or bad welfare that you can then act on, especially report to the vet. So that's what it's about. There's a distinction. You're not making a diagnosis. You're recognizing indicators of, of, of welfare. In this case, indicators of poor welfare. And so this is, for instance, uh, one of the tables. We have a table for, as I'll show you, for each class of animal, from invertebrates across. But how it works, <clears throat> how it works is that you look for, look for or see a particular sign, behavior. Behavior is an important indicator of welfare. Most of the uh, problems that I said earlier on that we see, we, we identify through behavior. Something doesn't look right. A lot of problems are internal. You can't see them, but the behavior will change usually. So you look for a particular behavioral sign. You go across to try and identify the cause. You have the keys over here, which are suggested possible causes. Look further down here into the, uh, the uh, full of information, and it indicates a possible association with that problem. You may have one or more signs 
uh, to, uh, to have to check out, but it gives you a basic assessment. Here's one for, <coughs> for mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, and invertebrates. Now, there aren't that many here for invertebrates. I don't want to give the impression that's because not much goes wrong with invertebrates. It's more a case of there's a limited amount of literature out there at the moment. But in time, I think you'll find that this list will expand significantly. Few people, not, not that many people at all, have realized that invertebrates show many signs of welfare that correspond to our accepted uh, ways of looking at other animals. We just haven't been very good at considering or thinking, them as, thinking about them as being candidates for, for suffering. But they are. And I'm not talking about um, the, the, what we would think of as the higher invertebrates, like the, an octopus or something. We're also thinking about scorpions and cockroaches and spiders. And here's just a quick, a quick reference list of, of physical signs that you can look for. Not behavioral, physical signs. And again, same sort of thing. Here's the problem. Here's the cause. These are all in the same thing. And so for an inspector, each of the categories that I've mentioned correspond to one or more of these criteria here. And it's a, a sample form, in other words, your score sheet at the end of an, an inspection. Uh, and you score between zero and three. Zero is an outright fail. Three would be the gold standard. You put your number in and say it's a one or whatever. You top, you do, top them all up to the bottom. There are 27 categories. You divide by three and you'll end up with a number between one and three. And then you're allowed to simply allocate a star. It's a one, two or three star place. A couple of... Um, sort of addendums of things I'd said I'd, I'd come back to earlier on and I've chucked in here. The interaction with transparent boundary behavior you will see a lot in uh, pet shops and zoos and other facilities with reptiles, you'll see them. And you will often see this kind of sign on usually a snake or a lizard. And it may well be that this is the result of the ITB behavior where it's rubbed its snout against the glass, resulting in an abrasion, an infection, and, and fuller damage beyond that. Or it's worth checking out in cases like this, if it's an arboreal lizard, as this is. And in nature, what they do is when they're startled, they will dive from the tree down into water or onto land, deep leaf litter. You don't have those things in a, in a cage. So they smash their face into the ground and it all goes wrong. Adrian mentioned burns earlier. Well, he showed you a nasty picture of a burn, if you remember that. Same animal, I think. It was a ball python, was it? Not? Yeah. And what happens is, uh, this is a, a thermal burn. You say, well, what other burn is there? Well, there's friction burns, chemical burns, oh, other kinds of burns. This is, this is a thermal burn, a heat burn. And what had happened in this particular case, this was in South Africa, but it could be anywhere. What happens is that nearly always there's a problem with the environmental range of temperatures. Reptiles need to shuttle between warm and cold, and they may want to settle themselves at a very precise temperature. You can't pick that temperature for them. People, many people say, oh, yes, I'm going to set the temperature at this or that. Bad idea. They may need to adjust their temperature by a degree or part of a degree when they want to do it, not when you want to do it. It may be subject to their state of, uh, their physiological state, reproductive state, their state of stress, their state of activity, state of health. Wide variety of reasons may want them to change their temperatures. With us, it happens really quite simple. Simply, we have physiological <coughs> mechanisms to raise and lower our temperatures. Pyrogen flows through our body, alters our temperature really, really quickly. They don't work quite that way. They have to move around. And in their environment, they will often want to settle on something warm. A big problem is that you can't always warm a fairly chunky body on an inadequate heat source. So they tend to cluster around it. They, they hold themselves to it. They can't heat their whole body, do localized damage to the nerves. Gradually, the whole thing turns out like this. So this is essentially a husbandry issue may have been nothing at all wrong with the snake. It's people looking after it and got it wrong. 
Some things are complicated. This lizard has very lumpy skin, which means looking out for lumps and bumps on it, it's a bit of a problem. So when you look at them, typically, uh, you'll, I mean, all vets tend to do this, but not everybody else does it, you'll tend to see whether the animal's even both sides. Is it lopsided? Is a lump one side and not the other? Probably the only way on this particular lizard, and if you, if you know them like the back of your hand, probably the only way of knowing whether there was a lump, and there was, there was an artiabsis here from a bite. Similar case with this turtle. That leg had to be removed, it was an abscess. A bite caused that. But you have to know what a turtle looks like in order to see it, to recognize it. But this is an interesting situation because, and you'll find this regularly when you make an, an inspection, superficially things look really pretty decent, pretty decent, all things being equal. It's a fairly spacious environment, it has some enrichment, the glass is a bad idea, but let's forget that for the moment. The key problem here is there's a very large, about two meter long, monitor lizard up on that tree, that branch. There are only two light bulbs above it, and it has a long body which it would want to heat. Now in nature, you go out, I don't know if you sat on a sun lounge, or the sun doesn't sit on your foot, and if it did, you, you would be what? You'd say this is not basking in the sun, and these are basking animals. So they need a facility that heats the whole of their bodies whenever they need to heat it, and it can't heat the whole of its body. And this is one of the things that leads to those burn issues. They will try and get closer and closer to a heat source, which he can in this situation, until they burn themselves on it, trying to heat the whole body. And this is even more extreme. This is all at the same facility. This is at Reptilia down in Newmarket. You have three heat lamps that cover the tail. What about the rest of this animal? Someone hasn't actually realized there is another half to it. A pretty big size to it. That body takes a lot of heating. And then they wonder, why is this animal sedentary? Why isn't it very active? Well, it's got to stay out on land trying to heat this massive body with these tiny, puny little light bulbs hovering, on, hovering over it. It's useless. And again, the same story. A very large snake. Not an overly restrictive environment. Not great, but not overly restrictive. But the basking site is here where the animal can barely be squeezed into it. Unacceptable. You see this kind of thing, you say no. And here are these large African tortoises. Same thing again, space-wise, not so bad. But look where the heat lamps are, right next to the sleeping quarters. So now you have photo-invasive environment straight away. It's disturbed by the light. Nobody had really thought this through at all. And then to the promotion, the messaging. Look at how these people are promoting these animals. We talked earlier on about responsibility. This is not responsible. Promoting an enclosure such as this for an animal to spend its life in is simply unacceptable. Conditions within any facility should be exemplary, as I said before. Absolutely exemplary. And one of the things that was mentioned uh, earlier on, a question was raised earlier on, was about animals being sold as, as easy to keep. Selling, this happens with mammals and it happens with reptiles. It does. And there's a very similar problem, but an added on problem for reptiles and other exotics in being sold as easy to keep is that you don't have the fallback protection of your local veterinarian as much as you do with a dog and cat. Almost any problem that you might get with your dog and cat, chances are, answers are just a high street away. It's not the case with exotics. You may have to travel a long way to see someone like Adrian. And so if you get a, a missold, impulse purchased bearded dragon, it's worse than a, an impulse purchased cat. Neither are good, but it's more problematic with the exotic. So don't accept people promoting animals as easy to keep. Clip their wings for irresponsible messaging. 
A quick run through the E-mode system, and I've separated this out and been asked to deal with it because I was one of the people who de developed it. I was one of about 18, but uh, developed it anyway. So E-mode is a, a simple tool designed to help people with decision making. And we promote it, and maybe you will too if you, if you look at it. The whole idea is that this could be placed into outlets and as many other facilities as you want that distribute animals so that people can make a more informed decision. And it, it was at a peer-reviewed journal, again, and it stands for easy, moderate, difficult, and extreme, E-mode. It's free, there are leaflets, it's online, you can go there, done. There's a website being developed right now which will have thousands of animals listed so people only need to tap on the species and they will see what score that species has in relation to its ease or difficulty to keep. The basics of how it was developed was to first, through a consultation process, develop a pre-weighted list of animals by class and type. So if you look at domesticated dogs and cats, things such as localized uh, expertise, vets are on hand for dogs and cats, they're very good with them. So you don't have to rate them as highly, you don't have to give them as many points. If you look at primates, for example, there are no primates that are easy to keep. None. So primates come right up as a pre-weighted high score. And what that means for the user of E-mode is that they find the kind of animal, if they find it's a primate, it's pre-weighted with 20 points. They then answer each of these questions about that particular animal. Every time it's a yes, they add the five points. If it's a no, you do nothing, you move to the next question. You get to the bottom, you add up all the scores, it's the 20 points, plus all those fives you've added together, and you'll have a number that corresponds somewhere along here. And the higher it goes, the more difficult it is to keep. Simple. Look at that. Now, one of the key things about uh, E-mode is it's subjective, it's independent, scientific evidence-based, and it's free, completely free. So anyone can use it, authorities or anyone else. And that's the, that's the essence of the messaging that I wanted to give you. No, thank you, Canada. Thank you.